Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck and a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks and this week one of the enduring mysteries surrounding the Beatles. What on earth is going on with the guitar solo in Let It Be? So as a Beatles fan, I've always been intrigued by the guitar solo, or I guess more accurately, guitar solos, on the song Let It Be. Of course, there were two officially released versions, the bubbly, Leslie-infused guitar solo of the single mix, and the harder, more aggressive, biting guitar solo included on the album mix. And incidentally, if you listen to the single mix, specifically the left channel in isolation, you will hear the ghost or the remnants of a third guitar solo, actually the first guitar solo that was captured when the band recorded the track. But either way, this slightly chaotic sequence of releases is fairly indicative of the state that the band had found themselves in at the time. While Peter Jackson's revisiting of the Get Back project did shine a light on the fact that it wasn't quite the dour, soulless, miserable experience that Michael Lindsay Hogg's earlier edit of Let It Be, released in 1970, would have led you to believe... It's not getting away from the fact that it did capture a slightly dysfunctional band, very much struggling under the mounting pressure of working to a deadline, with a film crew following them at every step. This again is then reflected in the unusual way in which the album Let It Be, initially penned to be called Get Back, was released, with everyone from longtime producer George Martin to up-and-comer Glyn Johns to Phil Spector having worked on the record in some capacity at some point. And ultimately, it was Phil Spector's mix which was chosen as the official album release in May of 1970. Consequently, the recording of Let It Be the song spanned the better part of 12 months, with the original master take, in essence the backing track, having been recorded at Savile Row on January 31st, 1969, incidentally the day after the famous rooftop concert and actually the last day of the Get Back sessions, and then further overdubs, guitar overdubs having taken place on April 30th, 1969, on January 4th, 1970, the better part of 12 months later. And it's this last guitar solo, the harder, more aggressive biting guitar solo that was recorded on January 4th, 1970, that I've always been particularly interested in. To me, at least, it's not particularly indicative of George Harrison's guitar work in the Beatles and is more reflective of the growing influence that his good mate Eric Clapton was having on his playing. Incidentally, you can actually see George eulogizing Eric Clapton's playing during this clip taken from Get Back. <laughs> Just Eric, because he's very good at that, you know, like improvising and keeping it going, which I'm not good at. You know, like a lot of guitarists can sustain even, but they play like a lot of shit. But his thing takes on a pattern, you know, and gets somewhere and resolves itself which is very odd. Now while George is playing and note choice undoubtedly bear witness to Eric Clapton's influence, it's actually the guitar tone on the album solo, which for me at least is most uncharacteristic of George. Biting and aggressive and with a much harder edge, again synonymous with the sounds that the likes of Eric Clapton had been getting, both with the Blues Breakers and more recently, I guess relative to the time, Cream. And as such, I guess I had always assumed that George Harrison was using his red Les Paul Lucy, incidentally, given to him by Clapton, and then used by Eric on the recording of the guitar solo from While My Guitar Gently Weeps in 1968. But in listening to the isolated guitar track for Let It Be, which became readily available as a consequence of the Beatles rock band game, I think there's a little bit more to it. As I said, when the basic tracks for Let It Be were recorded at Savile Row on January 31st, 1969, we can say with some degree of certainty that George was using his Rosewood Telecaster. Of course, he used that on the roof only the day before, and there is indeed some footage from that day floating around showing him using that guitar. But when it comes to the April 30th overdub session, when George recorded the solo for the single mix, there's no photographic evidence as far as I can tell from that day. So aside from the incredibly obvious rotating Leslie speaker that we can hear on that guitar solo, what he was using really is anyone's guess. Fast forward to January 4th of 1970, the day George recorded that album solo, and thanks to some newly surfaced photographs, we can at least have a stab at what you may be hearing on that recording. The Beatles, minus John, who was on holiday in Denmark with Yoko, had convened at Abbey Road Studio 2 for the final session, the final recording of overdubs for Let It Be, the song. Namely, a new bass guitar part for Paul, some cello, some backing vocals, some brass, and 
And the last recorded item of the day, actually the last thing ever recorded at a session with more than one Beatle present, George's new guitar solo. So what on earth is he using? The first piece of evidence we have is this photograph. Taken on January 4th of 1970, it very clearly shows George using a guitar that we've not actually seen in a few years at this point. It, of course, is Epiphone Casino, that he had sanded down in 1968 along with John. Even more interestingly, however, and something I actually didn't notice initially, but if you zoom in, you can very clearly see that he's taped up the F holes. Now, for anyone who's ever played an Epiphone Casino, especially at stage volume or with any kind of gain, this will probably make sense. They are entirely hollow and consequently, at the first sign of trouble, they will feed back uncontrollably. So with George evidently going for a slightly more aggressive biting guitar tone, this does make a lot of sense. It would be one way to get around the feedback problem. Listening to the isolated guitar track, it also does go a long way towards explaining that sound. As much as it is biting and aggressive, there's not much decay to the notes. They do seem to die quite quickly, which again, for a guitar whose natural resonance and feedback you are essentially trying to eradicate by sealing it up, this does go a long way towards explaining it. Now, in regard to George's amp choice, as much as there aren't any photographs from January 4th showing any real form of amplification, I have found this photo taken only a day earlier, the recording session for I Me Mine. Very clearly shows George using his 68 Silverface Fender Twin that the Beatles had been given in July of 1968. Of course, it was the main amp throughout those Get Back sessions. So, within reason, we have the amp and we have the guitar, but, Again, for anyone who's ever used a Fender Twin, 85 watts is a lot of headroom. And to me at least, again, this isn't those isolated guitar tracks, this doesn't really seem indicative of a Fender Twin being pushed. At which point the natural assumption is that George was using something to push it. Of course, the Beatles weren't averse to using modern technology, even going so far as to innovate new techniques entirely at various points, ADT being a good example, as well as having been pictured with the latest and greatest in pedal technology, specifically the Maestro Fuzz Tone, Tone Bender, and various fuzz faces throughout the recording process of Get Back, which, to take a leap of faith, is what this sounds like to me. A relatively sedate Fender Twin being pushed by a fuzz face and then being controlled by the volume and the tape across the F holes on the Epiphone Casino. Now, of course, this is a little bit of conjecture without any real kind of photographic evidence to attest to as much, so I guess the only way to try and prove this theory is to actually test it out. So I'm gonna to head to my good mate's Ed, thanks to the use of his brilliant studio, as very kindly offered to try and help me get to the bottom of this. He's a fellow gear addict and a Beatles fanatic. So this should be a bit of fun. Let's go and test it out. So here it is. It's a very kindly volunteer to try and help me get to the bottom of this. Um, if nothing else, he has an absolutely incredible collection of gear, a lot of which is gonna be uh, remarkably close to what we think George used on the track. First and foremost of which is this absolutely stunning 1964, Epiphone Casino. Of course, it is still in its sunburst state. It's not gone so uh, quite so fast to strip it, which we all know makes a massive difference to the tone, but that's another rabbit hole entirely. So uh, yeah, to start off, we have this absolutely stunning 1964 Epiphone Casino. Then we'll come back to the pedal in a second. In regard to amps, unfortunately, we don't have a 68 Fender Twin Reverb. We do have, however, a 68 Fender Pro Reverb. It's mine. The easiest way to think of this amp, to be honest, is it's kind of half a twin reverb in terms of its output. I want to say this is 40 watts, is that right? Yeah. 40 watts to so the twins 85? Pretty much. It's basically, instead of four 6L6s yeah. and a bigger transformer in a twin, that's got two 6L6s, so half cool. the power and a slightly smaller transformer, Yeah. but pretty much everything else. I mean, yeah. two of the two. same speakers, same size cabinet. Yeah. 212, yeah. So it's kind of half a twin, I guess, is the easiest way of thinking of it. Um, I guess the only thing you would notice, really, is probably a lack of headroom, comparatively. Twins, of course, as I said earlier, have been famously hard to overdrive, so you probably would get this to, um, yeah, the point where it's kind of naturally pushing a little bit quicker than you would a twin. But anyway, it's sounding good today. In regards to the settings on the amp, listening to that isolated mass recording, it is incredibly bright. So as you can see, we've got the bass barely on. So it's about one and a half, I guess. Treble up at eight. We decided against using the bright switch. And incidentally, we're plugged into the vibrato channel, even though we're not using the reverb. The reverb is off. Reason being, all of the photos that I've been able to find from George, from the Get Back sessions, from the rooftop show, any kind of stuff from that era, he generally seems to be plugged into the vibrato channel. John seems to be plugged into the normal channel. So it's a little bit of a kind of leap of faith again there, but it seems relatively uh, sensible. In regards to the thing in between, 
we have this. Now, of course, George wouldn't have been using a downdrive Austin Pride, but it's as close a kind of recreation as we've been able to find to a fuzz face. And crucially, also has the capacity to be able to switch through to germanium through to silicon. Me and Ed were talking about this at length because we're a pair of losers. Um, <laughs> and we think it sounds more like a silicon fuzz face than it does a germanium. It's a little bit of a okay, it's a kind of leap into the unknown a little bit, but it seems to be getting us very much in the ballpark. In regards to then the guitar, done a lot of experimentation with this today, and it seems to be getting closest when we're around about seven and a half. I say around about, that's incredibly specific, isn't it? It's enough to get it to kind of push the amp. We're not feeding back again, we're not kind of silly volumes here, so we've not seen so far uh, fit as to have to tape up the F holes. Also, I don't think Ed would have been overly yeah, thrilled about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, around about seven and a half seems to be kind of the sweet spot. So, um, and lastly, microphone. Uh, Ed, it is a Neumann. So that's that's a clone of an old Neumann um, U67, uh, which is what they would have used at the time. Yeah. Um, Beatles sort of switched using those on pretty much all their guitar recording stuff from sort of revolver onwards. Cool. Um, so this is the mic you can see in front of the cat. Yeah. Speakers so on. So that's a Paluso, back and... Paluso P67, I believe, but cool. it's one of the closest clones that we can get to that sort of mic. Inspector um, Paluso. Yeah, um, exactly. Sounds amazing, and we've got it, what are we talking, kind of 12 inches away from the speaker? Yeah, roughly that sort of spec. Again, referencing a bunch of pictures we looked at, because um, we're geeks in old Beatles books. Um, we've got the mic running into a, a Chandler Red preamp, um, into then pretty much straight into, uh, into Logic via the Universal Audio. Uh, Which I think is what the Beatles used, wasn't they? They, they, <laughs> yeah, um, they were big Logic fans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, quick demonstration of the sounds. Uh, first and foremost, turn the guitar up. Obviously, get a bit of hum. Very clean and very aggressive as well. It's a really, especially when you've got the uh, the treble up. We did experiment earlier with the bright cap, and it was uh, killing wildlife within about a ten mile radius. So, <laughs> yeah. thankfully, that's off. Kicking in the fuzz pedal. If we turn the volume up on the guitar full, I mean, aside from the obvious feedback, it's just very. It's too much. As soon as you start to back that off, as I said, about seven and a half seemed to be the sweet spot. About there. To me, at least, that kind of seems to get me in the ballpark. The last, literally the last point in the chain then, I guess, which is something I've kind of talked about at length in the past whenever I've done any of these kind of tone recreation videos, is the brilliant Match EQ plugin. So if you can uh, swing around a second, Ed, um, we can probably stop that recording, actually. Yeah. If we flick on the Match EQ for a second, basically takes the input, um, which in this case is the isolated track from George Harrison. If we scroll all the way back, there we go, we've got George's isolated master take there. Basically takes that as a reference and then gives you the EQ curve for that and you can be as harsh or as kind of general or liberal as you want in that. So we've gone full on kind of jagged and it seems to be getting us in the ballpark. So after all that, I guess all that remains to be done, see how close we've got. Uh -huh. 